right, let's go ahead and take your Bibles tonight and go to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And let's start reading in verse 14. It says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You know, it's interesting that these, uh, you know, since I was going to be gone all week, I prepared these messages on Monday and Tuesday. I don't normally do it that early in the week. I like to keep things fresh in my mind. But it was like the Lord wanted to help me out. And so he kind of like threw me in situations this week to just kind of remind me of what I was going to be preaching about. Just kind of keep it fresh and, and keep it in my heart. And you know, when, I, and when you, uh, you read this passage here, and I was thinking about this, um, um, when I it was, well, yeah, just yesterday, it feels weird. I was in Arizona yesterday, but when I, when we were in Arizona, we were out soul winning and we knocked on the one door and this, uh, a Chinese fellow came to the door and we invited him to church. And he's like, Oh, he's like, he's like, I have a, I have a temple in my house. And he's like, you want to come in and see it? And you know, and it, when a guy asks you to come in your house to see his temple, you have to go look. I, I know I was supposed to be soul winning, but I was like, I, I got to see this. We went in there and he had like this one of these divider things in there and he like slid it back and he had all this, you know, look, it looked like full blown Buddhism. Uh, he had a big Buddha statue and all that stuff. But then he's like, this is for, you know, all, all denominations, you know, for well, at least of all religions, you know, and he's all excited about it. And he takes me in the next room and he shows me this picture and it has like, you know, this cloud or something, probably Shekinah glory, uh, you know, up on the top that I guess was supposed to represent God. It didn't call it God. But I don't even remember what it said. And then like below it was like five different men. And there was guys like Mohammed and Confucius and, and Jesus was on there. And it had like all these symbols that kind of represented those religions. And interestingly, like the one on the top was a swastika, which I don't know how that got in there. And then kind of below them it had people like Buddha and all that. And it just made me mad seeing Jesus with all those other people. You know, I'm fine with all the other religions acting like they're fine. You know, the stupid coexist bumper sticker that I hate. I wish they'd take the cross off of it, all right? And he's he explaining how, it, you know, they're all the same. And I was like, well, you know, they're not the same. And I, I had some Muslims. I was, you know, I'm not used to soul winning and talking to, you know, Muslims and Mormons. But, you know, in cities, there's a lot more of those different religions. I, I had... I didn't get anybody saved the two days we went out and sold. I was getting hard people, you know, and uh, it was just, it, it was tough. But anyway, um, you know, he's trying to explain how they're all the same. These Muslims I talked to try to do the same thing. They're trying to say Allah and God were the same. And whenever I hear that kind of stuff, I always make sure when I'm presenting the gospel to people like that to show how, no, there is a difference between Jesus and all other gods. I always, I always make a huge deal about that. And I told him, I said, listen, I said, I agree with you. Allah did not have a son, but God does have a son and his name is Jesus Christ. And I, and I told him to, I told the Chinese guy, you know, all these other gods are basically said, except for that one you have on there. And I, and I told him, I said, you really should probably take him off of there. Because of the fact that he said, you're saying these are all basically, but he said, I am the only way to God. He's like, he never said that. Jesus never said he's the only way. And I was like, yeah, John 14, 6, I, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. No, that was only for that time. For that time. And in different times and in different parts of the world, you know, different ways. And I, I said, no, it says Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know? And I was trying to show him, no, it's Jesus only. And you got all these religions, they're fine with accepting Jesus as long as you're allowed to accept everything else too. I said, no, you can't, you can't do that. And you know, we didn't get anywhere with them, but I did. I was like, I, I want you to get our message. And our message is that it's only Jesus. And he is the only way to heaven. You can't use Jesus and all the other gods, it, it just doesn't work. And 
What I want to talk about tonight is separation. Okay? And I want to talk about embracing separation because people don't like that. No, I like the idea of all God's being the same. Let's all just be one. But that is not what God has called us to do. We see where he said, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. You know, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? You know what he's doing? He's saying, you know, there's some things that don't go together. And Jesus Christ and all other gods, they do not go together. And us, as the people of God, us who are in Christ, we are a separate people. We are not one with the rest of the world. We do not fit in with all other religions. And you know, whenever the Pope was here in America and he was having that like all faiths meeting and stuff, you know what? I didn't see any fundamental Baptists up there. And I'm glad I didn't see any fundamental Baptists up there. Because we don't belong up there. But what bothered me is people who supposedly represented Christians. You know, evangelical Christians, you know, and they try to group us in there. Let me tell you, I had no representative at that thing. And I'm fine. I, I'm fine with all the other religions want to get together. That's fine. But I wish they'd leave anything that represents Jesus out of it. You know, and you know, the thing is, if they ever did that, if they ever had some big get together and some big religious thing and they invited all the religions except Christians, you know, most Christians are so stupid, they would get offended by that. And they would throw a big fit about that. But you know what? I say, wonderful. That's exactly the way it should be. Because there is a difference between us and all the rest of them. I remember listening to Christians. Mike Huckabee. All right. Mike. I'm sorry. Mike Huckabee. He needs to stick to politics and stay out of religion. And I, he needs to keep his religion out of politics because his religion's messed up. And he tries to act like he represents Christians and Baptists. And he threw a big, huge fit. And he was trying to... Uh, influence people into going and downloading some song. I forgot what it's called, but it was a Christian song. It was on a Christian movie and it was a big hit and it didn't get any nominations. It got dissed or ignored at one of the, like, I don't know if it was Emmys or one of these music award things for TV shows. And I remember thinking, listen, if it's a Christian song, if the person who wrote it is a Christian why in the world would they want to be recognized at the Emmys? Do you know how wicked everything is that's involved? I don't know if it's the Emmys or one of the music awards. I don't know what they're all called. But listen, why would we want to be represented there? There is a huge difference between the rest of the world and Christians, or at least they're supposed to be. But yet we have all these Christians and so-called you know, Christians like Mike Huckabee trying to make sure we're represented in wicked wicked things. Why would we want to have any part in that? I don't want to have any part in that. I don't want those people on me. They shouldn't like anything that I put out. But that's the mentality today. And Christians are falling for it. And separation, while not a popular subject, it's a biblical thing. It's very biblical. And it's also necessary if we're going to be a victorious Christian. And for some reason, Christians today, you know, it's like, what can we do to blend in with the world? Yeah, and it's like we forgot that the one we serve is the creator of the universe. You know, the king of kings and lord of lords. We forget that one day he's going to rule and reign on earth. And you know what? The world's not going to like it. And we have an opportunity to prove now that we love him. But in, and instead of running from separation, I believe as Christians, we ought to embrace separation. We ought to be thrilled at an opportunity to really set out, you know, set ourselves apart from the world. And it's amazing too, because Christians, they are, you know, liberal Christians today, they're always talking about, you know, wanting to make a difference and wanting to stand out in the community. Well, let me ask you this. Why do, why do we try to stand out in the community? By doing everything that everybody else in the community does. Why do we try, why is it that they try to stand out in the community by looking in the community? We, I was talking with Brother Jerry about it, that most churches today, their ministry, as they call it, or their outreach, is identical to what Walmart does. Okay, where I work out at the distribution center, they do all these community involvement things. They have all these programs they do that is identical to what I hear a lot of these churches doing. Their little trunk or treat thing. You know how many churches do trunk or treat? Okay, now listen, if Walmart wants to do that, I don't blame them, okay? Yeah, they're going to want to do that because then people are going to need to go buy candy from Walmart, you know? They're trying to sell merchandise, I expect them to do that, but why would a church do that? You know, encourage kids to go out and buy costumes. I get why Walmart does it, because they sell costumes. 
You know, I understand why they want to do all these things to get their name out, out there. It's called advertisement. And listen, not all advertisement's bad, okay? Mar- not all marketing is bad. Even for a church to do some marketing, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but don't call it ministry, okay? That is not ministry. And what church is doing today, it's, it's identical. And it's, it's a joke. And they do, they th- it's like we've got to find some way to fit in with them. But listen, if you want to stand out, why don't we stand out like guys like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did? Those guys stood out, didn't they? Or Daniel. That guy stood out. You know, we're willing to do, it's like their way of standing out is blending in. Let's do what everybody else is doing. That's not how it works. God has called us to be separate. Oh, you can't build a church that way. Well, we're not supposed to build a church. We're going to let God build the church. And if God's going to build the church, we need to do things the way he told us to do. And he is the one that told us to be separate. And we need to practice this in our life. And just a few things tonight. When it comes to separation, I believe we ought to be separate in our worship. Okay, there ought to be a difference. Y'all see what he says? You know, what concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Okay, for ye are the temple of God. There's just some things that don't go together. There's some things that just don't mix. And listen, when it comes to our worship, it's going to be how a believer, how a real Christian worships, how God has commanded us to worship. Did you know it is not going to set well with lost people? Lost people are not going to be comfortable in church. They are not going to enjoy the hymns that we sing. They're not going to enjoy our music. They would rather hear rock music. They would rather hear country music or whatever it is that the world listens to. Because those things that the world listens to, they are of the flesh. But the things that we do, they are of the spirit. And listen, the, the reason we have so much in common sometimes is because we're made out of the same flesh. So we like a lot of the same things that the world does in the flesh, but spiritually there's a huge difference. The spirit has a huge problem with rock and roll music. The spirit has a huge problem with the country music and things like that. But the world today, it's like we got to figure out how to get them in. We got to make them feel comfortable. So, you know, let's, you know, modernize things. Let's go along with the culture a little bit better. But listen, there is going to be a separation in our worship. It's going to be different. It's not going to, it's not going to appeal to the flesh. But you go to most of these churches today, and it is all about the flesh. There is a very little difference between a Christian rock concert and a regular rock concert. It's the same thing. And it appeal, appeals to the flesh, and that's what these people are going for. But there is, there's a difference. Our worship should be different. You know why? Because our God is different. Our God is not like all other gods. We see in Exodus chapter 20, and it was given the first 10 commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. He comes first. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. You know, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. It's things about God. Our God is different from all other gods. He's above all other gods. He is the only God we should worship. You know, most other gods, according to their religions, it's okay to worship multiple gods. Not with our God. Our God's not willing to share in worship. Okay? Jesus Christ would not want to be in that picture with all those other men. Because why? Because he's separate. He's different. He is the son of God. He is the only begotten son of God. He is the only way to heaven. He said, I'm the only way. He said, and he, you know what? One of the things that Chinese guy said to me too, and I'm not being racist, calling him Chinese. He's actually Chinese, he speaks Chinese, doesn't speak a lot of English, all right? So I know, you know, don't look at me like I'm racist. You know what? You know what he said? He said, these are all doors. That's what he said. These are all doors. These are, it's a, he said, it's a narrow gate. That's what he said. They're all, he's using all these terms. I said, listen, Jesus, Jesus said, I am the door. Okay. And then he went into the, it's different. No, no. At that time, at that place, you know, you know, he, he, he just, he wasn't getting it. All right. He, he, he wasn't, he wasn't seeing it, but listen, there is, there's different. Our God, one God is not as good as another. And our God is the only God. And Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And we don't need to blend our worships like that guy was doing, trying to blend all these different things. I'll bet they sing some hymns there. I wouldn't be surprised. 
My wife had a family member that visited the church here, and he was telling me about this church he goes to. Where's the church? Oh, it's great. All faiths can come together. He's like, we have Christians, we have Muslims, we have Jews. And I'm like, that does not work. Those things don't mix. You can mix all the other ones you want, but leave Christianity out of it. Because ours is different. Ours is separate. And that is what God has called us to be. And so we, and we ought to love that. We ought to embrace that. Why? Because it's the only way. It's, it's it. It is the only way. Why would we change? Why would we compromise? Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And we ought to be separate in our worship. Our church service ought to look different than the other church services. Our church service doesn't need to have anything to do in common with the Catholic church or the Muslim church or the Jewish church or whatever. It shouldn't have anything in common. It's different. And so we, and we belong to him. And look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In verse 19, says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? We saw that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So since we are His, all right, since we are the people of God, since we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, what makes us separate, okay, it's not so much our, you know, what we do. It's not so much how we dress and things like that, okay? Ultimately, what makes us separate is the blood of Jesus Christ. When he saved us, he made us separate. So whether you're whether you live like it or not, you are all of those things. You are separate, but at the same time, there you do have a choice of whether or not you're going to act like it, whether or not you look like it. And we understand that we belong to God. He has separated us. Okay, He separates. A lot of people get confused. Turn back to Second Corinthians chapter six when they read that verse, and he says, um, "Wherefore." Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, um, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. When we, when you, a lot of people do it, and they think, well, you have to be separate for Him to receive us. No, for Him to receive us. Okay, wait a second. Let me, let me rephrase that. All right. People think in order for God to receive us. We have to be separate. And that's true and it isn't true. Okay. Now, when I say that, you're probably thinking, what are you talking about? Well, once again, many times we think being separate is something that we do for ourselves. Okay. But understand what sep- it's God that separates us. When you got saved, he separated you. Do you understand that? He's the one that made you different. He's the one that made you special. He's the one that made you holy. It wasn't your new wardrobe. That made you separate. Okay. It wasn't your new behavior. That made you separate. It was the blood of Jesus. That made you separate. But now that he has separated us. We have a choice. Of whether or not we're going to act like it. And whether or not we're going to look like it. Okay. So understand. That whether you like it or not. If you're saved. You are separated. Okay. You are separated spiritually. But are you going to act like it? Are you going to be in disobedience and act like the rest of the world? Are you going to act like you're with one with the world? And if you do that, understand you're, you're in disobedience because God has separated you. And so you ought to act like it. You ought to look like it. And so we should, we should be separate in our worship. Our worship it ought to be unique to the world's worship. And listen, there's other religions out there that do some things similar to we do. To what we do. And there's a reason for that. It's because they stole it from us. All right. Yes. Jehovah's Witnesses go out and knock doors and Mormons go out and knock doors. We were doing that before they ever did it. Okay. The Apostle Paul went from house to house. You know, the disciples went from house to house. They stole that from us. All right. Yes. There's other religions out there that sing some hymns. But they stole those from us. There's a lot of things that we do that other religions do. But that's the stuff they stole from us. Okay. And what the problem I have is Baptist churches now stealing stuff from the world. Stealing stuff from other religions. We have no business doing that because we are separate and we ought to be separate 
in our worship. We ought to be separate in our works. So we're not saved by works. We know that we talked about that this morning. But we are saved unto good works. We see that in Ephesians chapter 2. Okay, the Bible talks about you had the quickened you. You were dead in trespasses and sin. But God saved us. God quickened us. And then we see, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, created unto good works. Okay, God, we, we weren't saved by works. But when God saved us, guess what he wanted us to do? He wanted us to do the works. He wants us to do good works. And what if I don't do them? Am I not saved? No, but you're in disobedience. You're not obeying God. And we ought to be obeying God because he separated us. And so we need to act like it. And so our works ought to be different. We shouldn't be doing those works of the flesh. You know, the works of the flesh are these. And it names off all these terrible sins. We're capable of doing those things, but we shouldn't do those things because God has separated us. We shouldn't be adulterers and whoremongers and idolaters and all those things. We should not do this because God has separated us. Our works ought to be different. There's some things that we should never be involved in. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 through 8. Go ahead and turn over there. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. But be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Okay? Follow God as dear children. Okay? It's not uncommon to see little kids following their parents around. It's not uncommon to see a little kid following their parents and maybe even copying off their parents a little bit. Okay? And as children of God, if we're following God, we're going to be going where he goes. We're going to be doing what he does. We're going to be copying off of him and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor, but for an occasion and uncleanness and co or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks for this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance of the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You all see what he's saying here. People will take this passage too and say, if you do these things, it means you're not saved. But no, he's saying, listen, you at one time you were all those, you were those things or you were some of those things, but God saved you. He separated you from that. He cleansed you from that. You are not those things. So you know what? Don't do them. He's not saying you're not capable of doing them. He's not saying that, you know, a saved person is not, uh, would never would do them. We're capable of just about anything. Because we're made out of the same flesh the world is. But because of the fact that we have been saved and God has separated us, we are not those things. And that's why, too, you know, when the Bible talks about the unbelieving and abominable and uh, sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, okay? Well, what if a Christian tells a lie? Is a Christian capable of telling a lie? Absolutely. Well, then we're liars, right? No, we're not because the blood of Christ has cleansed us. So if we're not a liar, what are we doing lying? Okay, you know what we're doing? That's called getting in the flesh. That's called disobedience. And because God has separated us and made us different, we need to act like it. And so there are just some things that we just should not do that God has said, no, you are not going to do those things. I gave the illustration last week with my kids. You know, my kids are certain things. No, you're not going to do that. You are a McMurtry. Yeah, but what if, you know, the Smiths, they're doing it. Well, you know, we're made out of the same flesh the Smiths are. You know, I'm not saying a McMurtry is not capable of it, but I'm saying as a McMurtry, we're going to be different. Well, that's not what we do. And God, his, we, have, we have the name of God. He has adopted us. We are in his family. And therefore, there are some things that we should just never do. And if we do, we're in disobedience. And God has separated us. And so there ought to be a, a difference. And there ought to be, we ought to be separate in our works. And then we ought to be separate in our words. Okay. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, who are at Colossa, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Christ. Wait, I'm in chapter 1. Why am I reading chapter 1? I said chapter 3, didn't I? I was like, that's not what I was looking for. If ye be, verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members, which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some uh, some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You see all these things he's telling us not to do these things. And he's, he's on purpose. He says on purpose you have to do these things. You need to set your affection on the th- things above and not on the things of earth. We're not going to just naturally do that because we have this flesh. But we've got to renew some things in our mind. And on our, every day, we've got to mortify these members. We've got to put off this old man. We've got to put on the new man. We've got to remind ourselves, I'm not what I used to be. I'm not lost anymore. I'm saved. I'm a believer. And I need to remember, even though I still get in the flesh sometimes, and feel like doing these things, I'm not going to do those things. I'm determined not to do those things because God has told me not to do it. And some of the things he mentioned are just things of the mouth. He mentions, you know, not, uh, you know, put off the, you know, uh, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. Don't be lying to each other. There, we shouldn't be telling dirty jokes. Yeah, well, I think they're funny. Well, that's your flesh that thinks they're funny. But you know what? God doesn't think they're funny. And the Holy Spirit that's inside of you doesn't think that it's funny. So you know what? You need to be separate in your words and say, you know what? I'm not going to tell those kind of stories. I'm not going to use that kind of language. You might feel like it sometime. When you stub your toe, okay, that's 100% flesh right there. You know, and it, it hurts. And you might want to say something that you shouldn't say. But you know what? I'm going to put that off. I'm not going to say those things. I'm not going to have that filthy communication. I'm going to have a different speech. Chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. It says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Okay, We need to be wise in our speech. Because listen, one of the reasons we're supposed to be separate is because God wants the world to see the difference. And so He said, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without talking about the outsiders talking about the lost people the people that we have been separated from as we walk among them okay and listen being separate doesn't mean we all go live in a compound somewhere god wants us to live among this world because he wants us to be a light he wants us to be a witness but we're not going to be able to do that if we're just like them they need to see among the community some people who are different Some people who look different, act different, talk different. And so our speech needs to be with grace, seasoned with salt. We need to be careful the words we use. We need to use the right words. We need to use gracious words with people because we want to make a difference. There needs to be be a difference in our speech. Our subject matter. You know, know, the language, the words we use, there ought to be a difference between us and the world in that area. And sadly, there's just not many times with people, but there, we ought to be separate. We ought to be separate in our wardrobe. I'm going to say it. We ought to be separate in our wardrobe. Look, if, listen, if we claim to be godly, if we claim to be children of God, shouldn't we look like children of God? Well, that's what the Bible says. Look at what it says in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 9. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 says, In like manner also... That women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but that which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Notice what it said there. It needs to be, you ought to dress in a way that becomes women professing godliness. Okay? 
if you claim to be a child of God, people ought to be able to tell by the way you look. Okay, I, talk, I, w- I talked to a pastor one time. A pastor of a Lutheran church. I'll throw that in there. He's wearing a KISS t-shirt. The rock band. A KISS t-shirt. I'm like, you're the pastor? I mean, what in the world? I didn't, I didn't never guess that guy was a pastor in a thousand years, the way he looked. I remember when I was at Camp Joy, there was this lady that was, I remember the, everybody's dropping their kids off and there was this one lady, she's just kind of standing up there leaning against the building. And you know, I don't want to be mean, I'm not trying to be judgmental or anything, but she looked like a hussy. And you know, and, and I remember I'm, I'm seeing this, you know, this, most people that came to this camp were pretty conservative. And, you know, but I thought, you know, it might be some lost lady who's bringing her kid to camp, you know, so I'm not going to judge, not going to be mean, but I was just, I was shocked by how she was dressed. And then I remember I was talking to this guy, his kid was going to be in my cabin and you know, I was asking him about what church he's from. And then he's like, he's like, yeah, that's our pastor's wife over there. And he pointed at that lady. I'm like, that's the pastor's wife. And then all of a sudden I was judging again because I was just like, that's, that, that is not acceptable. That is not okay. I found out later my wife actually knows that lady. She got divorced not long after that and probably fooling around is what I'm guessing because she was wearing the attire of a harlot. And listen, our language, or not our language, our clothing, it says things about us. And I'm telling you, when I heard that, I was not surprised one bit. I mean, she was advertising the way she, the way she was dressed at a Christian camp. And the Bible says that they ought to dress in a way that becometh women professing godliness. If you claim to be a child of God, if you claim to be godly, your clothing ought to back that up. And that, that's what, that's what God said. And, but unfortunately, many people have said, no, nah, not worried about that. But our, listen, our clothing, it makes a statement of who we are. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 10, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. Now, you know, I don't know for sure. I don't believe that this woman was a harlot. Okay? And I, if we read the whole story, you know, she talks about the good men of the house being away. I don't know if that's talking about her husband. So if she's married, chances are she wasn't a harlot. But here's the thing. She was on a mission that night to get somebody. And so what did she do? She dressed up like a harlot. And you know what she did? She acted like a harlot, even though she wasn't one. And listen, as a Christian, if you're saved, you know, you're not a harlot, but you know what? Doesn't mean you can't dress like one. And it doesn't mean you can't act like one. And you know what? People, they, I don't know, dress affects people's behavior. It it, it just does. Dress of the way people dress, it affects their behavior. Okay, you know, these Christian rock bands that go around banging their heads and doing all the crazy things that they do, I've never seen them doing that wearing a suit and tie. Okay, now I will say in the southern gospel crowd, they will wear suit and ties and you'll see them do some pretty weird dance moves and things. However, there is a difference. Their suit and tie does not look like mine. Their suit and tie, they, you know, they didn't come from Walmart or you know Sears. Or anything. They always got the flashy, shiny, you know, suits and ties. There's a huge. So there's a difference. Yeah, the Southern Gospel crowd might be an exception with the fact they're wearing suit and ties, but it's not like this suit and tie. All right, it's not like you know your typical Baptist preacher uh, would would wear in church. But listen, it, your clothing it speaks a lot of things. And I'm not saying that I don't believe we ought to do things to purposefully stand out. Okay. For example, I don't think we all need to go Amish. Okay. I think that's immodest. You know why? Because that's drawing attention to yourself. I don't think we ought to try to draw attention to ourselves. But at the same time, you know, just dressing modest, it, it'll, people are going to notice. You know, people notice when you got a big family and the girls are all wearing skirts and things like that. You know, they notice, but at the same time, you know, we don't want to be noticed in a bad way and we're not, we're not doing things to try to be noticed. Okay. It's just, it's just noticeable because our society is just so dirty. Okay. And I I don't believe we ought to be seeking to get attention with our clothing, but our clothing should become what we profess. And if we profess to be children of God, we ought to look like it. And we shouldn't be looking like the world 
If I claim to be a man, I ought to look like a man. I don't need to be wearing a queering. I don't need to be you know, wearing f- female clothes and things like that. I, I have no business doing that. I'm a man. If you're a lady, you don't need to be looking like a man. You don't need to be wearing men's garments. You know, a woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination. It is not abomination. They that do it are the abomination. That's what the Bible teaches. There ought to be, I mean, we believe... I mean, do we at least believe in separation in clothing for men and women? I'd like we at least get Christians agreeing on that. But you know what? There's not, they're not, that's not even going on in most churches today. And there ought to be a difference. And so, because, because we are different. We are something else. Uh, God saved us. We are His children. And there ought to be a difference. And so, you know, um, you know our clothing... It, it is. It's a testimony to others. If you, we're not going to take time to read. If you read First Kings chapter ten, when the Queen of Sheba came through, she's noticing all these things about the congregation. One of the things she mentioned was their apparel. You know, I don't know for sure what they were wearing, but it. it she noticed it, and it spoke to her, and she was overwhelmed by the things that she saw in, in Solomon's kingdom. And I, I believe that people ought to, that they ought to see a difference. They are, they're, they're, it ought to be clear in this church who the men are and who the women are, whether you're in church or not in church. And we need to make, and we need to make sure that we practice these things because God has separated us. And so if you are not separate in how you dress, you are in disobedience because you're already separated. God separated you and you better, you need to act like it and you need to look like it. And Christians, we have, we have no business. There's no reason for us to try to blend in. With the world, Zephaniah one eight says, "This shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice. I will punish the princes and the king's children, and such as are clothed with strange apparel." Okay, what was that talking about? Well, you know, Israel, they were. You know, I, I don't see in the Bible where God gave specifics on how the children of Israel should dress. Okay, as far as you know, what exactly did their clothes look like? We don't know. We know the men were supposed to dress like men, and the women were supposed to dress like women. But he mentions their strange apparel that they were clothed in. What does that mean? That means strange often means foreign. They were looking like the heathen. They dressed the way the world dressed. And listen, there ought to be a difference between us and the world. Okay, there are some things, you know, I can't show you in the Bible where certain things are sins. Okay, but I don't know. What, what's a fad that everybody's doing today in clothing? All right, what's what's I don't notice these fashion things and stuff, but I don't know. Skinny jeans have got to be bad. Yeah, yoga pants. That's immodest. No, skinny jeans, yoga pants. I'm sorry, those are sins. Uh, you know, th- there's some things. You know, there are some clothing things you can do that aren't technically a sin, but they can be a sin because of what it represents. Okay, because it's like the world. All right, you know, so you know. If Taylor Swift, all right, you know, she starts, I don't know, if she starts wearing one of those Wonder Woman things around her head or something, all right, is there any sin in that? No, but listen, if that happens, if she did that, a lot of girls are going to start doing it. And you know what? The girls in this church shouldn't do that. If they're saved, they should, why? Because that, that's a worldly thing. Okay, you don't have to do that. I don't know, and, and I haven't seen anybody doing that yet, but if Taylor Swift did it, Girls all over would be doing it be- just because they're copying off the world and we don't, we don't need to be doing that. And you know, same thing with guys. All right. I don't know who, who the guy is. Everybody's looking up to, but you know, they're, the, you know, I don't know. All the guys that are starting all the trends today all look like queers. I mean, all of them. And so I, you know, and most stuff they do, it, it is wrong. You know, it is bad. Except you yeah, have the skinny jeans, all that. No, no doubt about that. That's a sin. But you know, we, we should, there ought to be a difference. No doubt about it. We don't need to be clothed in strange apparel. We don't need to look like the stinking world and all the fruit loops that are out there. And so we need to be separate finally in our walk. We see, um, well, turn over to first Peter chapter three, first Peter chapter three, verse three and four it says, who's adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating of hair and of wearing of gold and putting on of apparel, 
but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. This is talking to women here. But you know, what's more important than your outward adorning is that inward adorning. That you have what it mentions here, you know, the meek and the quiet spirit. And we need to understand that there are, you know, we ought to have a good spirit. We ought to have a good attitude. And you know what? A great example, you know, some of these Pentecostal women, all right, you know, Pentecostal women, they, they, you know, they dress modest. They wear the skirts that go to the ground. You know, they wear the hair in the bun. You know, they don't wear any makeup and all that stuff. But you know what a lot of them do wear is a nasty, mean attitude. I'm scared of Pentecost, the hardcore Pentecostal women. I mean, they are mean. They're critical. I mean, remember Brother Lonnie, we were sitting at McDonald's and that one was just on the phone. I mean, just bashing some woman in her church. And I don't know why they asked her to sing. She, you know, she's not, what are they, what, how did, how did she put it? Yeah, she's not in the spirit. Yeah, when she, when she sings, it's not of the spirit. And, you know, they should have this other woman sing. When she sings, it's of the spirit. And then she, she's dressed up as modest as all get out. Any Baptist preacher would be proud to have a woman that was dressed like that in their church. But let me tell you, she was warning that the attire of an old bag when it came to her spirit. I mean, and she was, she was mean, just nasty. And I've known some women like that in Baptist churches. Sometimes the most modest women in the Baptist churches are the most critical ones, the most mean spirited ones, the biggest gossips. And so, you know what? Great. I'm glad you got the outward adorning down, but you know what? It's time to put on a new personality. And we need to make sure that we do, that we, that we, there's a difference in our personality, that there's a difference in our spirit. And a lot of people, they got all the outward stuff down. They got the separation down when it comes to the outward stuff. But when it comes to the inward things, they haven't changed a thing. They are mean. They are nasty. They are ugly. I mean, listen, and, and I think every guy will admit this. There's women out there. That, you know, maybe you knew when you were a younger or a girl or something that she was pretty on the outside, but she was just hideous on the inside. And you know what? It made the pretty go away. You know what they say? You know, beauty's only skin deep. Well, how's the rest of that go? Uh, but ugly's to the bone or something like that. I can't, I can't remember. But let me tell you, there are, and you know, that, that pretty girl that's just nasty on the inside, let me tell you, she's going to age. She's going to change physically, but that ugly nastiness that's inside, it doesn't go away all the time unless they get saved. And you better watch out for that stuff. You better watch out for that people. And I do. I believe more important than separation on the outside is that separation on the inside. I believe we ought to have that. Okay. And I'm, and don't come at me with, well, you know, a lot of the people too, who aren't separated on the outside. Well, you know, it's the inside that counts. God sees the heart. Okay, but listen, man can't see the heart. Man can only see the outside. And just because you're so stinking holy on the inside doesn't give you an excuse to be unholy on the outside. Okay, and listen, if you're holy on the inside, you're going to be holy on the outside too. But understand, many people today, they think because they've got the outward adorning all down that they're covered. But listen, if you are, if you are that nasty old Pentecostal lady just bad-mouthing, people in their church, I'm sorry, you are not separate in your walk. And that is important. And that is a big deal. And listen, a true walk with God is what God wants most. Enoch, that's what he was doing. Enoch walked with God. Enoch, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And that's what it says in Hebrews chapter 11. What do we know about Enoch? Enoch walked with God. And that's what God wants. God wants us to have a walk with him. God wants us to have a spirit that's like his spirit. And it ought to be different. Listen, there's a spirit of this world. There's a spirit of fear. There's, there's, there's all kinds of evil spirits that are out there. And I'm not talking about, you know, the demons and things, but evil spirits that come from man, evil ones. And listen, as believers, we have the spirit of God. And if we get in the flesh, okay, If we get in the flesh, we can start acting like those evil spirits. But if we're walking in the spirit, we're going to have the same spirit of God. We're going to act like God. We're going to have the same attitude as God. And that's what we ought to have. And somehow Christians today, they've got this misguided idea that in order to win the world, we've just got to be one of them. But the, the only problem with that 
is if we are one of them, if we impress them, if we make them think, you know, we're ju- these people are just like me, well, then what are they going to need from us? Aren't we trying to offer them something? But if we're just like them, well, I don't need anything from those people. They're just like me. But no, we're, suppo- we're, we're not supposed to be, you know, the truth is we're not supposed to be different for the world's sake. But we are supposed to be different because we belong to Christ. Okay, don't be different just because, well, I, I got I to gotta be separate for the world's sake. You know, I, I don't want to be a bad testimony. That's fine. You know, those are good motivations. But ultimately, we ought to want to be different because of who we belong to. Because we are Christ. We, because we were bought with, a, uh, bought with a price. And when it comes to separation, I believe we ought to embrace separation. I believe we ought to love separation. Those who are in the military, okay, you know, Brother Adam, what branch were you in? Army. You were Army, and your wife was the Navy, right? Army. Oh, she was Army too? I thought you guys were in different branches. But you know what? If You probably, wouldn't, you probably don't buy your son little Navy outfits, do you? No. No, no you guys aren't going to do that. And you know what? People who are in the Army, they don't have a problem with people being able to tell they're in the Army. They don't try to, oh, I'm going to go get some Marines pants to put with this in. You'd probably get beat up by all your Army buddies if you did something. Hey, man, you're Army. What are you doing wearing Navy pants? You know, why would you do something like that? But that's the way Christians are today. We can't, why can't we be proud of the fact that, you know, hey, we're in the Lord's army. Why can't we be excited and feel privileged? Hey, I belong to God. I've been bought with a price. I am one of his. And why wouldn't we be proud of the fact that we're different? Why would we thank God that he separated us and enjoy that and embrace it and love it? I'm glad I go to a church that's not like the other churches because I have a God that's not like all the other gods. I'm glad I can look like one and act like one. God has given me a different spirit while the rest of the world, while the rest of the people I work with, they're going to have a bad attitude. They're going to be all nasty. I don't have to be like them because I have the spirit of God and I can have joy even though my boss is an idiot, even though my coworkers are an idiot. And I'm not saying that about mine, but even if that's the case, I can still have joy and I can still have a good attitude when my, when our company, it makes a bad decision that affects us negatively and everyone's walking around and complaining and moaning and groaning and cussing and whining and complaining. I can be thanking the Lord. You know why? Because I'm different. I've got something inside me. I've got the Holy spirit inside of me and you know what? I love it. And I don't want, listen, I don't, I don't, I'm not talking about being arrogant here, but our world is a joke. Okay. And you know what? Our community is a joke. I don't want to fit in. And you listen, I don't fit in. But it's not because of me. It's because of God. He separated me. He saved me. He's given me His Word. I've, I've been blessed to have been taught the truths of God. I've been blessed to have been grown up in a home that taught separation. And because of those things, not because of me, I am separated. I am different. And I love it. And I want to keep it up. And I enjoy it. I, th- I believe we ought to embrace separation. And when you hear preaching on stuff, you ought to get excited about it. Fired up about it. Because we, we are different. And thank God for it. And He did that for us. Don't get puffed up by it. God did that for us. And so, with that, let's all stand together.